Good afternoon and evening, everybody. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, we are gonna have a conversation, uh, I think one of the most important that's happening here in Davos, uh, not just about AI, which you've been hearing a lot about over the past several uh, days, but really the geopolitics and the implications uh, for nation states, uh, for regulation, for what this all looks like when it comes to defense uh, and so much more. And we have such a great group. And um, we wanna make this as interactive a conversation uh, as we can as well. Uh, sitting next to me is the Prime Minister, uh, Leo of, of, uh, um, uh, of Ireland uh, is with us. Uh, ne uh, ne next to him, uh, Caroline uh, Ed Stadler, uh, Australian Minister for EU and uh, Constitutional Affairs. Uh, Dimitro uh, Kaluba, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Ukraine. And we're gonna get into AI and its role in the war there. Uh, I also want to uh, point out uh, that uh, next to him is Nick Clegg uh, from Meta, a former politician. I want to talk to him about uh, sitting on both sides of this discussion. Uh, and then finally, Mustafa Suleiman is here. He's the co-founder and chief executive of Inflection AI. Uh, he's also the co-founder of DeepMind, which was acquired uh, by Google in 2014, and really one of the uh, earliest innovators uh, in the AI space. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm gonna to go to Nick if I could first, because uh, as I said to you, as I said at the beginning, you've, you've sat on both sides of this discussion, uh, being a politician and thinking about technology and its impact on society, its impact on the state, if you will, and now you are sitting uh, in the role of a corporation and business. Uh, and I think a lot of people oftentimes now look at businesses as nation states unto themselves. And so I'm curious, Sitting where you sit today, um, and also looking at how uh, the conversation about social media, frankly, where you work now and your specialty, uh, for many years people said, could this be regulated? What's its impact gonna be on the nation state, elections, uh, defense, all of these issues. Um, can government ever keep up with business? Well, in one sense, no. Um, uh, of course, the velocity, particularly of technological change, is, is, is quite different to the pace of political and regulatory and legislative debate. Um, but there are degrees of sort of um, mis, you know, misalignment. Um, and I think um, it is a good thing. It's actually a very good thing that in sometimes in a somewhat imprecise way, sometimes in a rather hyperbolic way, but nonetheless, and in fact, the fact that we're all speaking about AI, AI, AI this week in Davos is another manifestation of it. I think the fact that the political, societal, ethical debate around generative AI is happening in parallel as the technology is evolving is a lot healthier than what we've seen over the last, you know, 15, 18 years where you had the kind of explosion of, of social media and many governments are only now getting around to deciding what kind of guardrails and legislation they should put in place 15 years later after a great pendulum swing which swung from sort of tech euphoria and utopianism to tech you know, pessimism. And, and, and so I think, it, I think it's much better if those things work in parallel. The, the only other thing I would say is uh, um, we also need to ask ourselves, you know, who has access to these technologies? Um, I personally think it is just unsustainable, impractical, infeasible to, to, to cleave to the view that only a handful of, you know, basically West Coast uh, companies with enough GPU capacity, enough deep pockets, and, and, and enough access to data can, can run this foundational technology. It's why I'm such a, uh, we are such an advocate of open source to democratize this. And then the final thing I'd say is if you want to regulate this space, you can't respond to something, you can't react to something, let alone regulate something, if you can't first detect it. So if I was still in politics, the thing I would put right in the front of the queue is getting all the industry, the big platforms who are working in this already, but crucially the smaller players as well, and, and really force the pace on getting common standards on how to identify and basically have what's called invisible watermarking in the images and videos which can be generated by generative right. AI tools. That does not exist at the moment. Each company is doing their own thing. There are some interesting discussions happening in something called the Partnership for AI. But I, in my view, that's the most urgent task right. facing us today. Um, I'm gonna go out of order on the protocol here, Prime Minister. I'm gonna ask you to indulge me for just one second because I wanna ask Mustafa a question. One of the things that's been so fascinating to watch, I think the public's all been watching, is the industry has been quite outspoken about saying, there's gonna be a lot of problems with AI. 
please come regulate us. Please, we would love you to regulate us. Is that genuine? Is that sincere? And what is that about? And, wh and why is that happening now, this time, when it hasn't happened before? And is there a real view inside the industry that actually can happen? Look, I, I think that those calls are sincere, but I think we are all a bit confused. This is going to be the most transformational moment, not just in technology, but in culture and politics of all of our lifetimes, right? We're going to witness the plummeting cost of power. AI is really the ability to absorb vast amounts of information, generate new kinds of information, and take actions on that information. Just like any organization, whether it's a government or a company or any individual, that's how we all interact in the world. And we're commoditizing, that is like reducing the cost of producing and distributing that tool. Ultimately, it will be widely available to everybody, potentially in open source and in other forms. And that is going to be massively destabilizing. So whichever way you look at it, there are incredible upsides. And there's also the potential to empower everybody to be able to, you know, essentially conflict in the way that we otherwise might because we have different views and opinions in the world. Prime Minister, how concerned are you that AI ultimately can allow almost individuals to become nation states and can influence things in ways they never could before. We were talking earlier, even right now for you, there are deep fakes of you mm. all over the internet, all over the internet, saying all sorts of things that you never would have ever said. Mm. Some of them quite believable. Yeah, they're, they're, they're mostly selling cryptocurrency and financial products, so <laughs> I, I, I hope most people realize that's not what I actually do. Um, but um, but it, 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 it is a concern because, you know, it's got so good and it's only going to get better. And, you know, I hear um, audio of politicians um, that is clearly fake, um, but people believe it. But it's clearly fake to you. Yes. What are you going to do about making sure that the population... Is it, is it that the population needs to be educated enough to be able to identify and spot this on their own? Is the government supposed to do that? Is the technology company supposed well, to well, do that? I think the point that Nick made is very valid around detection is going to be really important so we can find out where it comes from. Um, the platforms have a huge responsibility to uh, take down content and take, down it quick, take it down quickly. Some, some are better at that than others. Um, but also people and societies are going to have to adapt to this new technology. Um, that will happen anyway. Anytime there's a new technology, people learn how to live with it. Um, but we're going to need to try and help our societies to do that. And that is, you know, that, that is around the whole, pace, whole, whole space of AI awareness and AI education. But as a technology, I think it is going to be transformative. I think it's going to change our world as much as the internet has, um, maybe even the printing press. We need to kind of see it uh, in that context. And the positive applications are also extraordinary too. You know, I'm, I'm a doctor by profession and I'm learning all the time about what AI can do in healthcare. And just think of all the unmet need out there in the world for healthcare because people can't see a doctor or can't get the test that they need or they're waiting for the test results to get back. So much can be done to make our world so much better. Everyone will effectively have a personal assistant um, uh, through AI. Uh, so. What can, what can be done, to me, is extraordinary and extraordinarily positive. But like any major new technology, there are real dangers, too. And How much are you worried about jobs about. for your people? Five, ten years out. You've read the reports. Mm. Everybody's read the reports that have come out all week about what's going to ultimately happen to jobs. If you, if you believe those reports. I, 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 I don't, uh, because uh, history tells us that any time there's a technological advancement, people... Um, believe it will eliminate jobs, what usually happens is uh, jobs change. Uh, and some jobs become obsolete and new forms of employment are created. Now, maybe this will be the first time in history that doesn't happen, in which case it's an even bigger transformation than, uh, than we expect. But I think two things that are potentially important. One is making sure that we're real and meaningful about lifelong education and second chance education and the opportunity to retrain. Uh, and that that becomes financially viable for people because it's it's likely it's probably already become the case that very few people have the same job for life most people have multiple careers so we need to make sure that that's normalized in our education systems um, much more so than it is now um, and I think one thing it, it might potentially do if we use AI uh, to our advantage as societies um, maybe it'll enable us to work less uh, you know maybe it'll be possible um, if, 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 if it's distributed fairly of course um, to allow uh, people to have shorter working days and shorter working weeks with the help with the help of AI. Right. 
uh, but that, will have, that won't just happen organically. We'll have to make that happen. Let me ask you an EU question. Uh, this is the uh, Internet uh, Market Commissioner, uh, Terry O'Brenton, uh, writing, the EU becomes the very first continent to set clear rules for the use of AI. So uh, the, uh, that the EU struck a deal on AI called the AI Act. Uh, and went on to say the AI Act is much more than a rule book. It's a launch pad, a launch pad for EU startups and researchers to lead the global AI race. So we hear about regulation on one side, and we've heard of probably the most aggressive regulation around tech has come out of Europe. But the least amount of true innovation on this topic seems to have come out of Europe too. Do you see a correlation between the two? Yeah, well, first of all, Thanks for the invitation and accepting me as the only woman on a panel where we are discussing very technical details also. Um, this should be natural, but I'm happy to be here because uh, I can certainly say that I agree on most of the points which were uh, mentioned here by the Commissioner um, because the European Union is definitely the first institution, if you want to say it uh, like that, who tries to categorize the risks of AI. And I think we can agree on one point. AI is a very powerful technology. And we see a lot of downsides also um, emerging from AI. Um, maybe we don't know everything by now, and I'm sure we don't know everything by now. But uh, the trial of the European Union is to categorize the risks. And from these risks, there are certain things that have to be done. For example, we all know spam filters, we know video games, so that's a minimum risk, that's a limited risk. But we see also risks we don't want to see. For example, social scoring. And for that, I think it's really important to do so. So if you ask me uh, or tell me that uh, not really a lot of uh, startups coming out of Europe, I think it's definitely this, the, the responsibility of an institution like the European Union to care for the future. And if you want to ask me if we should stop now here, I say no. We need global rules. And I, I think in an ideal world, we can agree on rules on some restrictions also in the whole world, together with the industry, together with technology, uh, to discuss what can happen. I'm not sharing dystopia. I'm not having the anxious that they could take over the power over us, not, not at all. But I'm a realist. I, I was a criminal judge in my former life. And I think it's really the time now to set some right. rules, to set uh, some... But then do you, do you say to yourself, then the, then the United States, for example, since a lot of the innovation seems to be coming from there, yeah. is failing to properly regulate? Well, first of all, also in the United States, there is the trial to, to somehow regulate uh, AI. Um, I, we had a discussion yesterday also. I think you were also there. Um, so um, we are definitely the first, and there is a political agreement already in the European Union, but we have to finalize yeah. it now. But also the European Union is doing, and I'm also uh, in the leadership panel of the Internet Governance uh, Forum of the United Nations, and also there we try to describe the problem and to find solutions for these risks which are unacceptable. Right. We we don't want to hinder innovation. I would like to be very clear on that. That's not the trial to hinder innovation, in the contrary. But we have to make sure that we keep the human oversight, that we keep it explainable, and, and you mentioned it already, that we also educate people. They should be able to deal with these risks and they should know which risks can emerge of this technology. Let's talk about Ukraine. Let's talk about what's happening in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, but also how Ukraine is using AI in this war. Because I think one of the things a lot of people uh, both see as upsides and downsides is how AI ultimately can be used on the battlefield, can be used in the context of war, not just on the battlefield itself, but on the uh, battlefield of information and misinformation. Uh, well, just a quick example. You usually need uh, up to 10 rounds, artillery rounds, to hit one target because of the corrections that you have to make with every new shot. If you have an, uh, uh, a drone connected to an AI-powered platform, you will need one shot. And that has huge consequences on the production, on the purchase, on the management. The, one of the biggest difficulties in the, in the counteroffensive that we were undertaking uh, last, last summer was actually that both sides, Ukraine and Russia, were using surveillance drones connected to uh, coming to striking drones to such an extent that soldiers physically could not move because the, the, the moment you walk out of the forest or uh, of the trench you get immediately detected by the surveillance drones who sends a message to the striking drone and you are dead 
So it already has huge effect on the warfare, and 2023 was pivotal in the transformation of warfare with the use of AI. And in 20, throughout 2024, we will be observing some undebated publicly, but enormous efforts to test and apply AI on the battlefield. But the power of AI is much broader than that. You know, when the, the uh, nuclear weapons emerged, it completely changed the way humanity understands security, security architecture, and to a large extent, it was an addition to diplomacy, a completely different reset of the rules. Now, AI will, be, will have a, even bigger consequences to the way we think of global security. You do not need to hold a fleet thousands of kilometers away from your country if you have a fleet of drones who are smart enough to operate uh, in, uh, in the region. That's just to say the least. And uh, when, computing, when quantum computing arrives and it matches with AI, things will get even worse for the global security and the way right. we, manage, we manage the world. So when we are thinking in Ukraine, because somehow God decided to put us at the edge of history, when we're thinking of the next kind of levels of threats we will be facing, and Russia will not be on the side of AI civilized regulated thing. We will be opposing a completely different enemy. And on a broader scale, I'm sure that there will be two camps, two, two poles in the world in terms of approach to AI. And when people speak about polarized world, it will be even more polarized because of the way AI will be treated. So all of this will change enormously. First, how humanity imagines its security, how diplomats try to keep things sane and manageable, uh, and most importantly, how we do all our work. Diplomacy as a job will become either extremely boring or as exciting as ever right. after AI introduction. Mustafa, as somebody who's inventing this technology personally, what do you think when you, when you hear that? And, and also, take us into this. At some point, we will get to AGI, right? It's going to happen, uh, artificial gel, uh, general intelligence. And when that happens, whoever has that technology, is that like, is that like a, having a nuclear bomb? Is that like being a nation state? If, 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 if your company or OpenAI has that first, is that some, is, are we supposed to think about that differently? I, I think that's far enough away that it's quite hard to properly speculate on the consequences. But, you know, as I was listening to Dimitro speak, I, I, I was reminded that I think one of the most remarkable things of 2023 is how much of the software platform that is enabling the resistance in Ukraine is in fact open source. The targeting mechanisms, the surveillance mechanisms, the image classification models. So one of the obvious characteristics of this new wave is that these, tech, these tools are omni-use, like dual use doesn't really sort of cut it anymore. They're inherently useful in so many different settings. And actually, when we look back at history at all of the major general purpose technologies that have transformed our world, there's a very consistent characteristic, which is to the extent that things get useful, they get cheaper, they get easier to use, and they spread far and wide. So we have to assume that that's going to be the continued destiny over the next couple of decades and manage the consequences of power, the ability right. to take actions becoming cheaper and widely available to everybody, good right. and quote unquote bad. Here's a technical question, maybe Nick and, 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 um, and Mustafa can speak to it. There's a separate debate going on about open source versus closed source. And right. Ahmed has taken a, 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 a open yeah. source approach. Right. Uh, I think you've taken a closed source approach for, for now. That's more commercial rather than, yeah. you know, okay, we're, but we're building our own models because we think they're better. In fact, they're objectively better than Llama 2. So according to the latest benchmarks. For now. Okay, but so, For now. It's true. Well, but true. So that, it, it, explain that approach, but then also contextualize it, if you could, as it relates to the public's ability to fully understand what, these, what is going on and, and, and their access to it. Well, can I just, uh, just amplify something that Mustafa said, which I think is terrifically important? Because you mentioned AGI. And... And I think one of the things that somewhat paralyzed and distorted the debate last year, particularly through the great hype cycle when sort of generative AI became a co concept which was familiar to people for the first time, was everyone immediately started 
sort of making predictions about where it was going to end up, that we were going to have some all-knowing, all-powerful... I mean, by the way, ask data scientists for a definition of AGI, you get a different definition from each single one. There isn't even a consensus on what AGI precisely means. And I think what, what we ended up then doing was having was saying, oh, well, we can't open source because it could be really dangerous in some distant future, which we can't even guess at yet. Right now, these models are, uh, I hope to, I, not to, I don't want to misinterpret, they're much more stupid than many people assume. They don't, they don't Sam understand. Altman has called them incompetent helpers. Well, of course, they don't understand the world. They can't reason, they can't plan. They don't know the meaning of the words that they produce. They are, they're actually tokens. Mm -hmm. They're highly, highly sophisticated, versatile, sort of autocomplete systems. But we should be careful not to anthropomorphize artificial intelligence. It's really, it's kind of, we confer almost our own intelligence on something which does not have human level intelligence. Now, there's a debate. Some people think human level intelligence is, you know, is a, is a, is a proximate thing. Others think that, you know, it's a, it's a much more distant prospect. But when it comes right. to access and who has control of this technology, for the technology that we have right now and that we're likely to have in the near future, there is absolutely no reason why that should be kept under lock and key by a few handful of very rich corporations. It is obvious that it is better for the world, particularly for the developing world, particularly for the global south, uh, for, for, for people to be able to use these systems without having to spend tens of billions of dollars on the GPU and compute capacity that only companies right. that Mustafa and I work for. Uh, right now, now, in a future, if these systems do develop an autonomy, an agency of their own, sure, we're in a different paradigm. We're nowhere near there. We're nowhere near there yet. Well, the, the, the definition of intelligence is in itself a distraction, right? It's pretty unclear, it's hazy a... concept. We shouldn't really be using that. We should be talking about capabilities. Right. We can measure what a system can do, and we can often do so with respect to what a human can do, right? Can this agent right. talk to us very knowledgeably about many of the topics that we all talk to LLMs about? In time, <coughs> can they schedule? Can they plan? Can they organize? Can they buy? Can they book? Those observable actions carry with them risks and benefits, and we can do a very sensible evaluation of those things. So I think we have to step back from the kind of you know, sort of engineer and research-led exciting definition that we've used for 20 years to excite the field to basically to get us to, you know, fund academic research, intelligence, and actually now focus on what these things can do. And that's where I think we have to complement the EU AI Act and the work that has been done there to focus on a risk-based approach of specific sectors in a very measurable way. And I, I think that's a sensible first step. You would agree with that? I think the, the idea of uh, identifying risk it, it's always better to try and regulate the risks, right. not the technology itself. And I think as long as you stick well, to Well, we might need to regulate autonomy. You just said that, right? So we will need to regulate capabilities as well as the applications because autonomy is clearly much more dangerous than having a right. narrow human in the loop. Likewise, generality is more right. dangerous than narrowness. If it's a narrow and specific application, it's more da right. dangerous than a general okay, so purpose. Let me ask the politicians on, on the stage. Let, let's say somebody tries to uh, influence the outcome of an election, yep. okay? Let's just say. Never. I can tell you tons <laughs> of stories way. about it. Is but if, the responsibility, and you could tell your story in a yeah. second, but is the responsibility the human who is taking the technology and leveraging and using it, or is it the folks who are building the technology to begin with a, 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 that have allowed this to even be used? See the distinction? No, I, I, th I think principally it's the person who's trying to misuse the technology for a nefarious end. Right, but does the, the, the folks who built the technology need to build in such safeguards to, to, to never to, allow? Yeah, yeah. I, I, right, I, this I, is I, a chicken I, and egg I, issue. I, I get the question, but is, is, it, is it possible to do that if you apply that to any, any other technology? How do you write into that? Well, I think uh, there are I mean, efforts I mean, going on right now with AI to, to, yeah. to effectively try to put some of those safeguards around it, no? Well, it's pretty hard to stop someone doing bad things with a cell phone or a laptop, right? And I, I think that, you know, the, the, these technologies are not that dissimilar. Having said that, there are specific capabilities, like, for example, coaching around being able to manufacture a bioweapon or a general bomb, right? I mean, clearly our models shouldn't make it easier for an average non-technical person to go and manufacture anthrax. That would be both illegal and terrible for the world. And so whether they're open source or closed source, we can actually retard those capabilities at source rather than right. relying on some bad actor not right. to do bad things. Caroline, but jump in. Coming, coming back to this point, you asked uh, who is, who, 
of whose fault it is um, mm -hmm. to, to break it down. And I think there is no technology in humankind or nothing which cannot be misused. Uh, the question is, can you as a user, uh, as a viewer, see the, the, that you are misused? Mm -hmm. So you should be educated, that you can filter, that you can see that it's a deep fake video of the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland and not a real uh, video. And this um, is what uh, will happen, I, I guess, in this super election year, 2024. Uh, so we have to be um, very diligently trying to educate the people, trying to uh, also push innovation in filtering uh, these deep right. fake pictures and videos, and, and then uh, try to bring social media or whoever, whoever is, um, is, is bringing the, them to, to watermark them. Right. I think this is, this is um, our common task and our common responsibility. I, I think, though, ironically, the use of AI and the misuse of AI in politics um, might have two unintended consequences. Uh, one, it might make people value more trusted sources of information. Uh, you might see a, a second age of traditional news, people wanting to go back to uh, getting their news from a public service broadcaster or a, a newspaper with a 200-year record of, 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 um, of generally getting the facts right. That might be one un, 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 unintended outcome. Another in politics might actually be uh, the politics starts becoming more organic again, and people actually want to see the candidate physically with their own eyes. Uh, wants them to knock yeah. on their door again, be in their, uh, you know, be outside their supermarket. And, uh, that might yet become an unintended consequence if people become so sceptical uh, of what they're seeing uh, in an electronic format. Um, they might want. Which suggests uh, a return when we to talk our, about restoring trust. You, uh, suggesting that, that this is going to undermine trust even more. I, oh, I, I, I think I think it will. Unfortunately. Um, I, I, on, on balance, I, th I think it will, um, but I think I think that can right. be dealt with in different ways. Um, going back to trusted sources, uh, real hu real human engagement having additional value again, and then bring, putting the tools into place so that right. we can deal with the misuse of AI when it happens. Nick, I, well, no, I just I, only I, I actually funny agree with a lot of that. I, I can easily imagine in the next few years. We've just talked about watermarking of synthetic content. Content to the prime minister's point, I can easily imagine a time where we will uh, all be looking out for watermarking for authentic and verified content. In other words, you'll come at it from the other end as well, so that you that you that you have a sort of reassurance that because right. the internet is going to be full of not just synthetic content but hybrid content. You know, sort of mixture, and most of it's going to be innocuous and totally innocent. But I think, you're, oddly enough, I, I agree. I think there will be a real kind of longing to be able to be absolutely sure that what you're seeing has a certain authenticity. The only other thing I would say about AI, yes, of course, generative AI can accelerate the deployment of synthetic materials and so on. It's also one of the best weapons to, uh, in, these plat in these distribution platforms like Meta to actually identify bad content in the first place. So if you look, at, for instance, at the prevalence of hate speech on Facebook today, it's now 0.01%. And that's, by the way, that's independently audited by EUI and so on. That's a reduce of so every 10,000 bits of content, you might see one bit of hate speech. That is a very significant reduction over the last two years for one reason alone, one reason alone, AI. AI has become an incredibly effective tool, the, right. the improvement in the classifiers at going after bad stuff. So it's a sword and shield. I think we need right. to bear and that And mind. investing in human moderators. And, yep. and awareness well, uh, raising. Uh, sorry to say. Because thank you for that, it, it, it by the was, way, human moderators. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was hard work to get there regarding hatred in the right. internet. I remember quite well in 2020, I started a process in Austria for the Communication Platform Act to raise the awareness that there is hatred in the internet. And I had a lot of digital conversations uh, with the social media platforms. And everyone sh uh, told me, yes, we are doing a lot and we, we will delete uh, the hatred in the internet quickly and so on and so forth. But we, need, we don't need right. any legislation there. Because because we are doing it on our own. So, and now it changed completely. Of course, there is the DSA in the European Union. Uh, social media platforms are obliged uh, to delete. There are the moderators, um, and it's important to have them. Um, but still, there is, um, it's, it's hard to draw the line. We had a lot of discussions. We could go in, 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 in several details on this debate. But this was awareness raising. I think the same has to, um, has to be done regarding AI and these right. things. And I would like to make one more point. Um, there has always been misuse. There has always been the trial to influence people. Yeah, well, every politician tries to influence the voters uh, to vote for them, for, for us, no? Um, but on the other hand, it uh, is much easier and much cheaper to do so with these tools.
because um, there is a comparison um, for Brexit and the influence of the people in Great Britain to vote for the Brexit. Uh, about 200 million euros um, were needed. If you want to do it nowadays with the technology on the ground, you need 1,000 euros and you can do it. Right. Because everyone can do a deepfake video. And this is something which changed right. our world and we have to, to raise right. the awareness in this regard. Dimitri, can you speak to that? Because I think that there's also the question of propaganda and how propaganda uh, is being impacted even in this, in the, in this war as it relates to, to, to AI. You know, I think you were about to go there earlier and we interrupted you and I no, apologize. No, 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 if, uh, I was listening to, to, to colleagues with great interest. I think if Davos had existed 500 years ago, we would have had the same discussion at the panel on Mr. Gutenberg <laughs> and his invention, the printing press. Yes. <laughs> because <clears throat> every time the, the humanity is facing the arrival of new technology of creating and spreading information, it faces the same questions. And the answer of the Enlightenment was that the more human being is, is exposed to information and the more opinions are avail become available to that person, then the more educated that person will become and the more reasonable choices that person will be making. Then came the radio, then came the television, then came internet, and then came social platforms which proved to the whole world that the fundamental assumption of the whole enlightenment is wrong. <laughs> People have endless access to information of any kind and they still make stupid choices. <laughs> My concern, and perhaps I'm wrong because people sitting on this panel are, smart, are deeper into technology, is that up until now, human being in making his political choice. Yes, was disoriented, his attention was distorted by bots, by uh, prepaid uh, uh, influencers, but at least that person had access to opinions. If you use search engine, I'm deliberately avoiding mentioning specific brands, right? The first page is filtered by an algorithm, but it still gives you different links to different opinions. If I open social media, I still get the opinions. But if I build relationship with an AI-driven assistant or chat, mm. I will have only one opinion. So the transition that I see extremely politically sensitive and culturally as well is the transition of a human being from looking for opinions to trusting the opinion of the universal intelligence as AI will be considered. And that will become a problem in terms of politics. Because when you ask, uh, we've been playing with one of the most famous uh, AI-driven uh, assistant and... Which one? <laughs> the one. The one. <laughs> the one. <laughs> don't, don't tell myself uh, of that. Uh, but, and the questions we get, we, the answers to the questions we ask about the war between Russia and Ukraine can be pretty peculiar. And when I asked some people who work on this, uh, who stand behind this technology, guys, does it mean that if Russia invested more for decades, had been investing more for decades in filling the internet with its propaganda, and it did have much more resources to do that, and we did less of that to prove that Crimea is Ukraine and Russia has no right to attack Ukraine. But the algorithm will actually be leaning towards the opinion of the majority. So if I'm a rock state and I want to prove right. that I'm the only one who has the right to exist and you all must speak my language, does it mean that if I spend billions and I do it in, involve automated opinion producers like bots and everything, the, G, the chat will come up with the opinion that actually it makes sense. It's not that it's not that, that right. useless. Okay. Okay. So I this is on, the on risk, that. shifting so, from opinions to right. opinion. Uh, the, I would the, love the, to hear the reaction that, to that. That potentially is, is the biggest shift in political terms because generally speaking, even now with social media, political communication is, is the one to the many. So it's right. the prime minister making a speech, it's the priest making a sermon, it's um, uh, the newspaper talking to the many readers, um, it's the thing you see on, on social media that, that's seen by lots of different people. It's one to many and it's transparent. With AI, it's going to be one to one. 
it's going to be you and your assistant, mm -hmm. and it won't be seen by anyone else. It'll all right. be done in private. So can I ask a different question? Maybe I'll go to Mustafa on this. You know, if you talk to people in Silicon Valley, um, or by the way, if you talk to people outside of Davos, they would say that there is a, a, an elite view of the world, and one of the reasons that the elites have, have lost credibility and trust is because they've tried to force, uh, uh, force feed a particular <laughs> worldview, and that actually, the, you know, Elon Musk would tell you that X and others like it provide multiple views. You get to hear all the different views, and to think that the public is so stupid that they don't understand is a terrible way to think. And yet, at the same time, when you have these multiple views and people seem to gravitate towards only trying, even though there are multiple views out there, they try to gravitate towards the views that they have, it creates a, this remarkably uh, challenging um, complex. Ex philosophically, I'm so curious, Mustafa, how you think about what you just heard. I think it, it's important to appreciate that we are in the very, very beginning of this new era of technology. So it's true to say that in 2023, there were one or two or three chatbots or conversational AIs. But that's like saying, you know, there was the printing press and then there was one book, right? I mean, there are going to be yeah. millions and millions of AIs. They will reflect the values of all the organizations, political and cultural and commercial, of all of the people that want to create Which will and create propagate trust information or undermine in the world. trust, though. That's the, that but it will do both simultaneously. So it's also true that it reduces the barrier to entry to accessing factually accurate, highly personalized, very real time, extremely useful content. Right. And you have to fundamentally, in my opinion, ask yourself the question what is the core business model of the agent or conversational AI that you're talking to, <laughs> right? And if actually the business model of the organization providing that. AI is to sell ads, then the primary customer of that piece of software is in fact the advertiser and not the user. But if the business model is entirely aligned with your interests as an individual, and you know, you're know you paying for it, and there's transparency and a fiduciary connection between you and the personal assistant that knows so much about you, I think that you have a higher chance of seeing right. a much broader and more balanced set. Okay, I'm not gonna speak for Nick Clegg, but Nick Clegg, I think, would say that if you can democratize. Would he? Would he? Whoa, right, so you tell me. <laughs> you tell me. Ask There's an AI. argument to be made that advertising allows the democratization uh, of some of this technology because it allows people uh, access to use some of this technology in ways that they may not be able to afford if they were charged to do so on a personal basis. This goes to the underlying business model question. Yeah, no, the, 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 the very powerful arguments in favor of an advertising financed business model which is obviously used by companies like Meta, but many, many others besides, is it means you're not asking people to pay to use your product. So anyone can use it, whether they're right. rich or poor. For the, a fancy banker in Wall Street or a, or a farmer in Bangladesh can use Instagram and Facebook and WhatsApp on exactly the same basis because it's paid for by advertisers. By the way, one commercial incentive, which of course does flow from advertising, is advertisers don't like their ads next to ghastly, vile, hateful content. So actually, despite the repeated assertion that there is a commercial business model incentive to promote extreme content, <laughs> we actually need to do the reverse. Right. But, can I, but um, one, one point which uh, I think is, is essential to remember is, does anyone seriously think that if you watch a particular cable news outlet today with a very fixed ideological point of view, or a British tabloid newspaper with a very fixed ideological point of view, that you're getting a richer menu of ideological and political input than you get on the online world today. I, I just think we sometimes over-romanticize the non-online world as if it's, been, it's one which is replete with lots of diverse uh, opinions. It's simply not, it's not, and in fact, quite a lot of academic research has, has shown that the flywheel of polarization is often driven by quite old-fashioned media, both highly partisan newspapers and partisan cable news outlets in the US. Um, does any of the uh, politicians on the, on the dais want to respond to that? And then I think we should open up for questions uh, in the audience. Well, I, I just wanted to add that, um, of course, you can find every opinion in the internet if you're searching for it, but you should not underestimate uh, algorithms. And uh, we find uh, people very often in the internet in so-called echo chambers. They get their own opinion uh, reflected again and again and again. If you read a paper, you have different journalists uh, writing. So I'm not, uh, I'm not romanticizing um, at this time, and I'm using the internet um, yeah, very intensively, let's put it like that. But you have to search for these different opinions. Otherwise, you maybe um, end up in an al algorithm and in an echo chamber. Questions? I see a hand right there. 
please uh, stand up if you could and we'll get, get your microphone. And please identify for yourself if you could. Of course. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my name is Razia Akoc. I work for Agence France Press in Brussels. I cover EU tech normally. Um, I have a question that I'm going to direct first to the Prime Minister, um, because you mentioned something about how AI's risks are controlled, that must be controlled. And I wanted to ask you concretely, how, how do you make that happen? Is that the EU AI Act, the US executive order, etc.? And linked to that point, and this is perhaps for, for everyone who'd, who'd like to answer. We know that the UN has this panel, and we've been talking about how this conversation needs to include the global north and south. Mm. How, how do we get them involved in the conversation? Is the UN pan panel part of that? And um, a question particularly for um, Miss uh, Caroline uh, Edstadtler. I hope I've said that right. Um, what can Europe do to have more European champions? Um, because I'm, I'm directing this question to you as a voice of the EU on this. Do you think the EU AI Act will make sure that the, there will be European champions? Or Thank you very much. Go for it. Yeah, I, I, I think ideally we'd do it uh, in the form of an international treaty and, as we were talking before, um, an international agency. Um, I don't like to create too many parallels between AI and nuclear technology, but we do have international treaties and we have um, the International Atomic uh, Energy Authority um, uh, which is well respected in, in making sure that the rules are followed and regulations are followed. Um, but I know how hard it is to make, it, make an international treaty happen. Uh, and that's why it does fall to uh, the US to do what the White House has done with the executive order, what we're doing with, um, uh, with, um, with, with the AI Act. And very often uh, the Brussels effect comes into play that uh, the European Union is the first to, re to, to, to regulate and regulate in the way that we are and others then follow on that and build on that national champions in Europe? Well, um, first let me reflect on the, the Global South because of course in the Internet Governance Forum the Global South is, is uh, included. Um, the IGF in 2022 was in Ethiopia and it was very important to have it in Ethiopia to discuss these issues because I'm convinced that AI can help us to, um, to, to become better in so many fields, uh, quicker health uh, areas and other ones. But we have to um, bear in mind that so many are not connected to the internet at all. So um, if we are talking about this problem, how to regulate AI, it's a luxury problem for those who are connected. Uh, that's certainly right. And I think uh, the United Nations are trying to get them in via the IGF and the leadership panel. And we have this mandate over two now more years until the um, summit of the future to present uh, also some some solutions and, and, and some recommendations how we can get on and get them included. Regarding uh, the, the European champions, of course the AI Act itself won't create um, European champions. Uh, in the contrary, we have to do a lot more, um, for example, to get rid of the obstacles of the single market, to fulfill the single market in the end, to make the market of Europe attractive uh, for startups and to keep them here. And I think there are a lot of uh, good examples in the world, um, if I'm thinking from, from the US uh, to Israel, where this is um, also in the mindset of the people. And I think we have to start with the mindset of the people. Trial and, and fail is something which has to be there on the way to a champion and this should be allowed also in Europe. I think we have a time only for one more question, unfortunately. Professor, I'll get you the microphone. Uh, Mustafa, you mentioned that uh, capabilities should really be what we'd be looking at. And uh, in writing and just on the stage, you talked about artificial capable intelligence as a metric. Um, you made it very specific at one point. Uh, could an agent make a uh, million dollars with a hundred thousand dollar investment in just a few months uh, um, and uh, I'd be interested in your th and now a lot of people are working on these sorts of agents where the LLMs c connect to the real world and carry out instructions and buy things and, and so forth um, you said maybe AGI may be far away how far away do you think is uh, it is till we pass an agent passes that kind of a test your 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 artificial capable intelligence test. And what does that mean for regulation and to, for the other panelists? Uh, how would that change the way you think about uh, AI uh, if we had that kind of technology? Mustafa, I'm gonna give you the microphone as the, the final answer because we're gonna run out of time in just a moment. I apologize. I mean, we, we, we've had the Turing test for over 70 years and the goal was try and imitate human conversation and persuade a human that you are in fact human, not an AI. And it turns out we're pretty close to passing that. Maybe we have in some settings, it's unclear, but it's definitely no longer a useful test. So I think the right test, the modern Turing test, would be to try to evaluate 
whether an AI was capable of acting like a, an entrepreneur, like a mini project manager, an inventor of a new product, go and market it, manufacture it, sell it, and so on, and make a profit. I'm pretty sure that within the next five years, certainly before the end of the decade, we are going to have not just those capabilities, but those capabilities widely available for very cheap, potentially even in open source. Mm. I think that completely changes the economy. Right. Uh, we're over time, but I do want to find our uh, host from the World Economic Forum, who's going to make some final comments. Yeah, thank you for the great panel. I'm Jeremy Jurgens, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum. And as we've heard in this panel today, the uh, AI doesn't stop at national boundaries. It has a global impact. And this can cut across a number of areas. Uh, I think we've also heard from the minister that when we think about governance, we need to look beyond regulation, uh, you know, managing for the risks, but also unlocking the opportunities. And the World Economic Forum is actively working on all of these issues, and we'd invite you to participate with us. Uh, we're working through over 20 uh, different national centers, the majority of which are located in the global south today. We're working to ensure equitable access and inclusive access to data, to compute, to the various models, and ultimately the capabilities that Mustafa spoke of, they can actually improve uh, the lives of citizens around the world. And uh, invite all of you to work with us, and again, I'd like to thank uh, the panel here. Thank you. I want to thank all of the fabulous panels, and thank you for your questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.